just finished The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron, and I wanted to make a little book review. I've never done a book review, but um, I want to try. So like I said in the title, something like the best book for artists ever. I've only read a few artist-oriented books, so I can't tell you that for sure. This was crazy. I literally just finished it a few minutes ago, and I wanted to talk about it like right away while it's fresh on my mind, you know? So just a quick just a quick synopsis of how this book is laid out. Basically, I think there's 12 chapters, and it's designed to be read in 12 weeks, so one chapter per week. Then it gives you some activities to do, and at the end of each week, it asks you how you did on keeping up with those activities, like a training course sort of thing. And I believe this book was written in tandem with this course that the two co-authors like teach together. And so I'll just read you the table of contents, the titles of each chapter, to give you an idea of what it's like. There's an introduction, they walk you through their basic principles, basic tools, there's a couple tools which I'll get to in a moment that they insist that you do while you read the book, and afterwards. Week one is recovering a sense of safety. Week two is recovering a sense of identity. Three is recovering a sense of power. Four is recovering a sense of integrity. And it goes on, a bunch of different things. Possibility, abundance, connection, strength, compassion, self-protection, autonomy. And the last one is recovering a sense of faith. So week one looks like this. This is what the start of each chapter looks like. There's always a couple pages of writing. And then, then there's like some tasks. And then there's like a check-in. And the check-in kind of asks you, how did the tasks go? So what do I want to talk about with the book? It was honestly nothing like I expected. You know, like the quick judge by a cover. Having the header say, a course in discovering and recovering your creative self. I don't know, that doesn't sound very... But for context, this book came out in 1992. So I think that's some good context. So that's good to know, because obviously... It came out before the internet, kind of, and it came out before cell phones. I think a perspective of art and creativity before those things is really interesting and, like, very effective. So two of the big tools, like I mentioned earlier, that they teach are one, the morning pages, and two, artist dates. Dates as in taking yourself out on a date. So the morning pages, the morning pages are three pages that you write in a journal. You literally are just dumping your brain out. You're just saying whatever you need to say. You're just dumping out what's ever on your mind. It's not supposed to be anything great. You don't need to try super hard. You can if you want to. But the main point is just to dump the crud and clear the crud out of your cranium. It's meant to be like a sort of therapy technique, in my opinion. It's a way to get your... Get like just the juices flowing in your body. You get practice sitting down, doing something creative. You actually do it and you do it every day. And also important point about the morning pages is that you're not supposed to read them at least for a couple weeks, like eight weeks at least. It's a place where like you're not supposed to judge yourself. You can put whatever thoughts that are on your mind, anything embarrassing, anything you're ashamed of or whatever. Put that on the page and you turn the page and you don't go back to it. It's not meant to be a journal that you read back through at the end of every week or whatever. She does say that after 8 weeks or 12 weeks to go back through your morning pages, read them non-judgmentally, and just take away whatever you want to take away. Like, did you have any good ideas that you think you might want to work on? So the morning pages I've been doing for a while now. I've been experimenting with like doing them first thing in the morning or after a morning walk or uh, like later in the day. and. Right now, at least, I prefer to do them right when I wake up. It is a little bit of a grind. Three pages, handwritten, is like... I'm really just spitting out a lot of random words. Like stuff that's really irrelevant. But I do feel a sense of... I just wrote this in my morning pages this morning. I do feel like there's a, a good sense of purpose behind them. Or like that it's doing something meaningful. Or like there's a therapeutic effect. As I make it a more regular thing, as I do it for like months on end instead of weeks, we'll see how it goes. We'll see how much, see how it changes and we'll see if it gets easier or like, I'm sure it will evolve into a different feeling than it is now. That's like a big component of the book. Did you do your morning pages? Keep up with your morning pages. And then the artist dates are about treating yourself, treating your creative child within yourself or like treating your creative side. She always talks about how your creative side or your creative self is like a child, so you have to treat it like, you have to nurture it like a toddler, or however you want to imagine that. You have to feed it, you have to take care of it, you have to like take it on walks, 
stuff like that. And the artist dates is taking your artist self out on a play date. And it's like spending time every week, once a week, an hour, a couple hours, doing something that strictly stimulates your creative child within. For me, that could be like taking out a sketch pad and like scribbling crazy drawings, an hour, half hour, whatever. Or it could be a whole number of things, like taking yourself to the movies. She frames it as an important form of self-care, self-love, nurturing sort of activity. That one I haven't been, I haven't done as religiously as the morning pages, but she makes a point that it's very important. So I'm gonna try and work on that in the future. So why do I say this is an important book for artists or people who wanna be creative and make things. Some of the most important things for me are when she talks about the fears and the struggles that you'll face as you go down this path of reconnecting with your creativity. And honestly, like her perspective of everyone has a creative side and everyone is an artist. Debunking the myths of the artist wants to be alone for their whole life or they have to be the weirdo or like ostracized from society to, to do what they want to do. Okay, this was an important piece. She says, the morning pages are a primary tool of creative recovery. We're all victims of our own internalized perspective perfectionist and nasty internal and external critic the censor with a capital c she says the censor is that voice that you get in your head when you do something or you just make something and then the censor with that voice pops up and it's like that's garbage or leave this to the professionals or something like that so she says while doing your morning pages make this a rule always remember that your censors negative opinions are not the truth and that this takes practice by spilling out of bed and straight onto the page every morning you learn to evade the censor and i thought this was a really important point because i was getting blocked just doing the morning pages she says the censor's opinion doesn't count there's no wrong way to write the morning pages i've already noticed that's spill over into my other work like right now like I can just say whatever and I don't need to compare myself to whatever professional book reviewer that I could be comparing myself to right so like I was talking about with the block she talks a lot about how most people who are in need of a creative recovery are blocked and the block means that their creative energy is pent up and like it's jammed there's many reasons why you may be blocked, but doing the morning pages and reading this book kind of help you. It helped me be aware of the block and avoid it, reduce it. She also talks a lot about how your creative recovery has a lot to do with discovering yourself and that your creative self is like your true self that's kind of buried within yourself because of what you've learned from society growing up or whatever. Now that may seem like confusing or weird, some people but that sort of mindset of your true self finding your true self that like speaks to me pretty well before reading this book i felt like that was an important pillar of life exploring the self finding the true self and so this really makes sense to me how your creative exploration is a dive into the self something else she brought up that i thought was important and useful is a section she titled the reading deprivation and i took this as since this was written before like the internet and before phones i took this to mean information deprivation withholding lots of stimuli can lead to a lot of breakthroughs and a lot of growth so she says keep yourself from reading but i feel like a lot of people today at least myself i mean, do a lot of reading in the first place so I should probably remove something that is actually taking up space in my life so i treat that like my phone my phone is off right now and it's maybe 12 p.m 11 a.m i turn my phone off before bed I'm trying to do that earlier then i leave it off until like midday the next day and i've been doing that for at least a week now and it's been pretty good i think another thing i try to remove is tv and youtube time limiting those and the phone has totally led me to actually desire to do more creative work and get going on the projects that i know i want to do but i'm just dilly dallying procrastination sort of thing and she's like don't be surprised if you have a flood of great ideas because you're removing all that extra stimuli that's something that's worked for me i think she talks a lot about success and what success means, what it's like, to, what it means to make it. And obviously that's a very relative thing. Her point when talking about success was success will almost always be evasive. Once you think you got to the level where you think you made it or do whatever you hoped to do, you might find that there's like another source of emptiness. And so that leads her to think and believe in her experience that the success is really the finding of yourself and the practice of creating, helping others on their creative healing and themselves, if that makes any sense. Talks about dreams a little bit. I like to write down my dreams in the morning pages when I can. I'm talking about your nighttime dreams, not like your daytime dreams. I feel like your dreams can solve problems in real life 
for you because I think they have for me. She like kind of touched on that, which I think is cool. Ooh, and this, this was pretty cool. She has a section titled The Virtue Trap. So The Virtue Trap is a trap that many people find themselves in that's like, oh, we need to be working. We need to be making progress. We need to be improving at all hours of the day. She puts it as even though we're trying to do good by wanting all that stuff, we're actually depriving ourselves of important emptiness and alone time and downtime to like space out the brain and like smooth out the brain, you know? The virtue trap is also, oh, I can't do my art right now. I need to be working to make money to pay bills. Or, oh, I can't do my art right now. I need to be like working out to like stay healthy. I don't know, those aren't great examples, but it's like the virtue trap is how we like, we keep ourselves depleted at the expense of some other life goal that we think we need to keep bolstering. Okay, here's a better explanation. Afraid to appear selfish, we lose ourself. She's saying, oh, our duty to society and all sorts of other responsibilities, we use that as an excuse to neglect ourself and neglect our creative side. And that builds up over a long time. She talks about how that turns like cancerous and it turns you into a menace to the people around you and to yourself. Okay, moving on, moving on. Oh, she talks about the abundance mindset a little bit. I think that's really important. I really need to work on that personally. So the Tao Te Ching is a book by Lao Tzu, I believe, and it's a book about Taoism, and that talks a lot about emptying. It talks a lot about emptying to begin by emptying, and I think that's a really important piece. The morning pages are kind of like emptying. Also, like going through the stuff at your house, getting rid of things, is an emptying. It's really effective to get you going, headed into a new direction, a clean slate sort of situation, right? Okay, I think I'm gonna I think I'm gonna take a shower. I'll be right back. So I thought of a couple more things I want to talk about that are in the book. One thing is a shadow career, this concept that she calls a shadow career. And it's basically the idea that somebody who has big creative dreams, say to write a movie or be a director, might take up a shadow career as in like a stagehand or like an assistant on a film set. Or like will kind of take up a career that's adjacent to what they want to be doing because it pseudo satisfies their desire in their dream. And it can be even more mundane than that. You wanna you wanna be an inventor, create and design things. You might work at a design company and do sales or marketing or accounting or like something that's related, but it's not necessarily on the path to becoming to manifesting like that dream of yours. I feel like I and many other people are led down that path to the shadow career because it's like, oh, we know this career exists. It's kind of related to what you want to do, so you should pursue it. We know it's a safe route, and that's kind of, at least in my opinion and her opinion, a great way to get stuck and get blocked creatively and deny yourself those dreams and aspirations that are very important. So that was good to learn about, just to know, just to know that as a concept and to be aware that the urge to do the shadow career can be lurking around every corner. It's another another guiding concept to help you keep the ship steered where you want it to be going. Okay, another big thing, another important thing she wrote about, in my opinion, is this idea that, that we're, we have like an addiction to anxiety and that we choose it over making the small progress that we know will help us get us closer to our dreams or to what we really want to be doing. And this is kind of like a be ruthlessly honest with yourself sort of thing, but it's also, it just kind of illustrates how anxiety works. Anxiety can, will get you like heart racing, it'll get you feeling concerned, right? Its whole existence is to get you to move to change the circumstances. And she talks a lot about how going down the path of our creative healing will lead us to a lot of fear and discovery in ourselves. And that, that fear, and discovery might be seemingly more stressful and feel more dangerous than actually making the steps to our creative recovery and creating the things that we want to make. And to be more specific on that, to be more specific about the anxiety, addiction, monster thing, uh, is she says this. One of our favorite things to do instead of our art is to contemplate the odds. Instead of taking the next steps, we have a toxic emotional loop. That leads us to ask, what's the use, instead of what's next? As a rule of thumb, the odds are what we use to procrastinate about doing what comes next. This is our addiction to anxiety in lieu of action. And once you catch this, the jig is up. Watch yourself for a week and notice the way you will pick up an anxious thought to blow off or at least delay your next creative action. And I don't know if this is more common for me or if this is a really common thing with many people, but over the past few years when I've been trying to like explore my creativity and like learn how to be an artist and learn how to make stuff regularly, this has been something that hinders me big time because there's always the thought of, oh, the chances of you making this a successful thing are so low, etc., etc., which might not even be true, but it's just there. It's just like an unhealthy thought loop that 
feeds itself on the chances of you making it to turn this into like a full-time thing oh that's so far off it's gonna take years and maybe it will what she pointed out is telling me contemplating the odds is usually a waste of time it's usually a distraction so instead of contemplating the odds do your next action record your next video or write your next page or get back to the drawing board get back to the studio whatever whatever Okay, three more things. When I was in the shower, I was thinking, I realized this book is great because it's more than just for artists. It's more than just for creativity and it's for more than just how to become an artist. It hardly even explains that specifically. It's really more about learning how to take control of your life and get moving on the things that you actually want to do. And if you don't know what you want to do, it talks about how to find what you actually want to do. And it's framed as the artist's way and the artist's recovery because everything we do in life is creative. Not everything is art, like capital A art. Kona. Sorry, the dog was eating the cat. Say hello, meow bird. Say hello. Yeah, so this book isn't just about art. Dude, chill out. So it's not just about art. It's labeled as a self-help book, but I think it really has some good, it really has some good healthy wisdom to pass on, to pass on. Oh my God. I think it has some real therapeutic practices that can be learned and applied to anybody's life. Not just people who are trying to become a capital A artist. I don't think I'm even trying to become that. I'm just trying to live joyfully and contribute to the world in a way that I think is good and helpful. So yeah, it's more than just about art. Another thing that I found was really cool is that I've, I don't really think that I've had many or any real creative role models that I know in real life. Like sure there are people on the internet which I look up to and admire, but what you see on the internet is not always designed to be, it's not the back and forth or intimate conversation that you would have with a mentor, that you could have with a mentor sort of figure. And reading this book, it felt like I had a creative role model. Julia Cameron, the author, she, I don't know what she's doing now, but 30 years ago she already had 25 years as a professional artist. Spent like 10 of those years or 15 of those years helping other people find their, their artist's way. And reading this book felt like a little bit of a one-to-one -one conversation with an artist mentor sort of person. And lastly, at the end of the book, there's a section called The Sacred Circle. It's another one of the reasons why I wanted to make this video and, and share the book. Basically, it talks about how success for artists, in whatever terms that means, comes in clusters. And that doing art and making things and being creative is meant to be done together and is meant to be done in service to each other and ourselves. The sacred circle, she says, is built upon respect and trust. The image of it is the garden. Each plant has its name and place. There is no one flower that cancels the need for another. She's right behind the camera. She's chewing on it. Dude, chill. There's no one flower that cancels the need for another. Each bloom has its unique and irreplaceable beauty. She explains the sacred circle to mean that as artists, we're meant to help each other, create with each other, for each other. And that the sacred circle is a group of people who you trust with your creative thoughts and ideas. And that in the creative circle, it's a sacred space. There's no room for negativity and that it's a place to nurture each other and help each other grow creatively and spiritually. Yes, I would say. And so with sharing videos like this on YouTube, I mean this to be part of my like sacred circle with hopes to encourage and help other people find their creativity and really just live a meaningful life. So that's another reason why I shared this. Hopefully you found some use out of my review. Maybe go read the book. I'd give you my copy, but I want to keep it because I'm going to read it again. Um, thanks for coming to my sacred circle. Thanks for joining my sacred circle. I will talk with you soon. If you got any book recommendations for me, let me know. I would love to know. So thanks for watching. Hope this helped. I hope you have a nice day. And apologies, this was all over the place. Didn't write an outline. Next time I'll probably do that. But it was kind of fun doing it off the cuff, so.